Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, my name is Michelle Garcia, and I am the Educational Program Coordinator at the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. And if you are here for our webinar about MOTS, you are in the right place. And today we're going to be talking about all about the magic of moths um, and how this really underappreciated little insect plays a big role in pollination and in just like a beautiful nighttime activity that you can do with the whole family. Uh, we'll get officially started in just another minute here or so and let some of the late stragglers come in. Uh, but in case you were wondering, this is a Zoom webinar. So it's being recorded, um, and as a webinar, you can see and hear me, but I cannot see or hear you. Uh, there will be questions and comments during the presentation. So if you have any questions, feel free to find that little Q&A button at the very bottom of your screen, or some of you, it might be up at the top of your screen, um, and click on it. And at any point during the presentation, feel free to put in a question or a comment and I will get to all questions and comments at the very end of the presentation today. I hope you all are having a good week. Happy 4th of July to everyone who celebrated yesterday. And I also hope that everyone is keeping cool this week. Um, I am in you know, the South Bay. That's where most of this presentation is gonna be talking about the Bay Area moths. Uh, and it's been very hot here this week. So I hope everyone's keeping cool um, and, practicing safe activities this during this really hot week. All right, I think it's time to officially get started. For those of you who are just popping in, my name is Michelle Garcia, and I'm the Educational Program Coordinator at the Santa Clara Valley Oak Place Authority. And it is time to talk about the magic of moths. We're gonna have this program wrapped up at about 30, 45 minutes. So sit back and enjoy. And then again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to find that little Q&A button at the very bottom or at the top of your screen uh, and ask your questions. All right, let's share my screen. Okay, also, I know that the Zoom on my end is being a little weird, so hopefully it's all showing up okay on y'all's end. Um, I don't know why, but... It, it's giving me like that my internet is not doing great, even though it's the same internet I always use. So hopefully it's coming out okay on your end too. Mm -hmm. Let me share my screen, please. Someone in the Q&A typed that you sound great to me. Thank you. Now, if it would only let me share my PowerPoint with you guys. Come on now. That's so strange. Okay, I'm going to try one more thing. Sorry, it is not letting me pull up my PowerPoint. All right, um, just do high screen, there we go. All right, so today we are talking about the magic of moths, a virtual adventure with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. Uh, at the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, we help protect water, wa water, wildlife and working lands. Uh, we're a like government-based nature preserve agency in South San Jose. We manage four different preserves, Coyote Valley, Sierra Vista, Rancho Canada del Oro, and the newly opened Mayana Yakima Coyote Bridge. Uh, today, you know, it was a virtual program. We try to do at least one virtual program the first Friday of every month 
around lunchtime. Uh, that way everyone can, can tune in with us, even if you are not from the South Bay. And today we're talking about moths. What are moths? Why are they so cool? And what moths might you be able to see in San Jose? I'd also like to acknowledge that the Open Space Authority works within lands that were originally stewarded by the Wazwaz, Chochenyo, Mutsun, and Tamian speaking peoples. Today, we are honored to partner with the Amamutsun Tribal Band and the Mwekma Loni Tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area in our shared work to protect and restore the environment and connect people to land. So today we are talking about the magic of moths and National Moth Week. I don't know if you all were aware, but moths are so cool and so special that they actually earned themselves their own special week to celebrate that is a, a national wide celebration. So today we're gonna to be talking about why moths are so special and why they deserve a whole week of celebration. Starting off strong with what actually are moths and why do we care about them? Uh, so moths, just like butterflies, are an insect, a flying insect in the order of Lepidoptera, just like butterflies. They function the same way where they have, you can see in this photo, a flying little insect with big wings and a long proboscis that it uses to drink nectar out of flowers. Uh, just like butterflies, they have a very similar life cycle. They get laid as an egg, they hatch out as a larva or a caterpillar, they crawl around eating plant material, grow big, form chrysalis, and then out pops, pops a moth and or a butterfly. Uh, but of course, even though there are a lot of similar similarities to butterflies, moths are different. And describing those differences is actually a little complicated because there actually are no true differences between moths and butterflies. Which is strange because a lot of us are probably looking at this photo and saying, oh, like, that's a moth, for sure. Even though it looks like a butterfly, I can tell that that's a moth. And while there are a lot of common differences between moths and butterflies, there is an exception for every rule. Um, just like most things in nature and in science, um, all of these rules are true most of the time, but not all of the time. One great example of this is that a common belief is that butterflies are awake and active during the day, meaning they are diurnal, whereas moths are awake and active at night, which makes them nocturnal. One very clear exception to that rule is the moth we're looking at right now called the white-lined sphinx moth. Uh, it is a moth that is mainly active during the day. So just like most, most moths are nocturnal, active at night, but there are exceptions to every rule, and the white line sphinx moths is a great example. So let's get into some more common differences between moths and butterflies. Again, there's exceptions to every single one of these rules, which is so funny. Yeah. So I, one common difference that I hear, like anecdotally, that gets pointed out between moths and butterflies is that moths are just ugly butterflies which is so, so silly. Moths are beautiful creatures. Um, in this photo, I have uh, a butterfly, a bay checker spot butterfly pictured to the far left-hand side of the screen. And then on the right-hand side, I have two photos of moths. And I think the photo of the moth that I have displayed in the very middle um, really proves that moths are not just ugly butterflies. Moths are beautiful and oftentimes really cute. Uh, the photo that I have in the middle of the upper screen is called a rosy maple moth. They can be found out on the east coast and that is its actual coloration. It is this lar like relatively large fuzzy pink and yellow moth that is so cute and so beautiful. Uh, I feel like I've kind of chosen like a more cute moth to show you but there are also like very beautiful ornate detailed moths. Um, they get a bad rap. I feel like a lot of moths are kind of commonly brown, but it's simply not true that moths are just ugly butterflies. Uh, moths are beautiful too. We've also already talked about that most moths are nocturnal, whereas most butterflies are diurnal. Again, not true for all of them, but true for most. Um, another way you can kind of tell the difference between moths and butterflies is by looking at their antennae or antenna. 
if you look at the Bay Trigger Spot butterfly in this left-hand photo, and uh, kind of at the bottom of the photo, you can see the antenna coming out of its head. You see two antenna, and they've got like, you know, thin lines, and they're almost like clubs or bulbs at the very end of their antenna. Most butterflies, their antenna are structured like that. They're thin and long and then end in this kind of like a round bulb. <laughs> Excuse me. Whereas moths, um, they have a slightly different structure of antenna. If you look on the very far right hand side, I have another photo of a moth, and you can see how its antenna are long and thin, just like a butterfly's, but at the very end, there is no bulb at the very end. It just goes to a thin point. Same thing with the rosy maple moth I have pictured here. You can see that it's, you know, long antenna ends in a point. Um, but the rosy maple moth that you see in the middle is actually a male. You can tell because of it kind of has like fuzzier antenna. So males have fuzzier antennas so that they can pick up pheromones and other scents uh, from females. So that's a, one main difference for most moths versus most butterflies. Another really common difference is the body structure and the fur of moths, which we'll talk about a little later, why moths tend to be so big, like the body of moths tend to be so big and fuzzy. Uh, you can see this rosy maple moth is a great example that it's literally like kind of fuzzy and fluffy looking, and its body is quite large when compared to its wings, whereas the butterflies the body is very small and the wings are very big. You can though see in this picture of the Bay Checkers Bat butterfly on the very far left, that its body is also kind of fluffy and fuzzy. Uh, just not as fluffy and fuzzy as most moths. And lastly, another really great way to tell the difference uh, or decide if something is a moth or a butterfly is its resting wing placement. You can see in the photo on the very left-hand side, the Bay Checker Spot Butterfly, its wings are rested up. They're up and together. And that's a very common way for butterflies to rest their wings up and clasped together. Or they rest it just laying flat all the way down. Whereas you can see in the moth photo on the very right-hand side, its resting wing placement is almost like back on its body, almost like a little shell. Um, it's very common for most moths to lay their wings either kind of open like this rosy maple moth or kind of back on its shell like this other common moth that we have on the very far right hand side. So to summarize, difference between moths and butterflies. Most moths are nocturnal. Most moths will have a long thin antenna which kind of ends in a point. Most moths kind of has some fuzzy, furry, big bodies, and have kind of a shell or open resting placement. So that's generally how you can tell the difference between most moths and most butterflies. Again, there are exceptions to every single one of those rules, which is a fun time. Oh, another kind of cool difference to point out between moths and butterflies is that most scientists believe, evolutionary speaking, moths are older than butterflies and butterflies evolved after a common ancestor, which is very interesting. So moths, along with kind of having a different body structure and a different look and also being active at night, they have some really unique adaptations that allow them to thrive, uh, especially adaptations that allow them to thrive at night. Most moths that are out around at night are looking for mates, they're migrating, and especially they are looking for nectar from flowers and their pollinating plants. Some adaptations they've adapted to help them thrive and do these things at night include a really heightened sense of smell and especially hearing. Moths are known for having really, really good hearing and night vision, but especially hearing. Uh, this is due to the fact that their main predator at night is bats. Bats, you know, they're looking for flying insects to eat. And what are moths but another flying insect? And so moths have developed many very good strategies for you know, trying to find their way around bats and not get eaten. And one way they do that is having excellent hearing. 
That way they can hear when a bat is coming. Um, another way they evade bats is with their fluffy little bodies. You see this photo of a moth. It's kind of got fuzzy wings, a fuzzy body. It's called a Luna moth, which is very cool. Also found on the East Coast or in like Midwest East Coast. And so bats use this thing called echolocation to find insects. They can't really see well at night. And so they rely on this echolocation where they make a clicking noise and they wait for that echo to come back so that they can hear what is around them. And it's surprisingly accurate and it's a great way for them to find insects, except when it comes to many moths because the fur on a lot of moths' bodies helps to diffuse that sound. And some of them are actually like impossible to pick up with echolocation because of the way their fur is structured and their scales are structured on their body. Um, so some of them, their furry body helps them be silent or invisible at night to bats. Some other moths though take the opposite approach. Um, and the Luna moth is a great example where they will actually become extra noisy to help uh, distract or divert the bat's attention. Um, the Luna moth is a good example because its long tails add extra noise and extra diffusion for these echolocation. And so when a bat goes to try to get a Luna moth, they often are like chasing the wrong echolocation because the tail adds extra noise. And so it, it helps to distribute the sound differently. So it's hard for the bat to catch it, which is interesting because those tails make it definitely harder for this moth to fly very well, but it actually helps it not be caught by bats. And then other moths are actually, they smack their wings so hard when they fly, they make extra clicking noises, which just confuse the bats entirely. Uh, they're very good at trying to avoid bats, which is pretty cool. Now they are doing this all for the sake to get their next meal, which is getting nectar from a plant and pollinating these plants. Uh, due to a lot of more recent research, they found that moths are very undervalued pollinators. They do an amazing job at pollination, but because they are more active at night, whereas most butterflies and bees are more active during the day, they have not been getting the same level of research, but they found that moths actually pollinate on average more species than bees or butterflies. Not only do they pollinate more diverse species than bees or butterflies, but they also pollinate a lot of the same species. So that way that species is getting double the amount of pollination through different access of pollinators, which is really cool. They also tend to visit plants that bees and butterflies do not visit. This doesn't come to a surprise to me because there's a lot of plants that bloom in the evening slash night. And that is the plants that often are overlooked by bees and butterflies and the plants that moths solely pollinate. Also, their big fuzzy bodies often make them very efficient pollinators. Uh, there are studies done where they like swabbed the pollen on different moths and they found that moths can carry more pollen for a longer amount of time. Um, moth, moths are the primary pollinators of plants like honeysuckle, morning glory, and yucca. They've also found that moths are pretty determined pollinators. They will really, they're not afraid to like sit on a flower and really search for ne nectar, which is really important for plants like yucca because the nectar is really far in the flower. It's really hard to get to. And moths are one of those pollinators that are not afraid to work hard to get to their nectar. Uh, and then they pollinate more, which is really cool. There's been more and more research lately about how moths pollinate and how effective they are. But especially as we continue into this conversation where we're seeing less pollinators and a decrease in bee species and butterfly species, um, there's more and more conversation about including the moth in more research just to figure out exactly what role they play in the pollination of these different plants and how important they are. So let's think more about what moths can we find in the Bay Area. There are 
hundreds of species of moth in California alone. Um, and so I highly recommend using something like iNaturalist or Seek. If you don't know what iNaturalist or Seek is, they're basically these two free apps you can download on your phone and you can take a photo of a moth and it'll help you identify what exactly it is or what you're looking at, uh, which is really nice. Cause like I said, there's a lot of different species of moth. Uh, now the moth that we're looking at in this photo it's called an emperor moth or a silk moth. Um, and although a moth like this might be easy to identify, there are a lot of just smaller brown moths um, that are called, let me check my notes, that are like torix moths or in like the torix family, which can be really hard to differentiate. And so it's nice to have some kind of tool to help you identify them. So iNaturalist and Seek are great options. Now you can find the emperor moth or the moon moth, silk moth in the Bay Area, which is really cool. I have never seen one, but I'm hoping during National Moth Week later this month, uh, I will be able to get out and see one for the first time because they're so cool. There's a, a species of moth in this family that has up to a six inch wingspan. It's one of the biggest moths you can find, which is very cool. More moths that you can find in California or specifically in the Bay Area are shown in this photo. Um, in the upper left-hand slide, we have the plume moth. The plume moth is the one with the weird looking wings that are like sticks and you don't see any antenna sticking out in front. Again, there's an exception to every rule. The plume moth is a weird little exception, but I think they're so cool because they have such a specific uh, shape and structure to them. They almost look dragonfly-ish. And so it's nice when something is unique like that. So that way you can identify it easily. And there are a lot of plume moths in the Bay Area. So if you go out mothing later this month, you will see plume moths. There's also outlet moths, um, which is shown in the very upper middle, the very upper right-hand side is another torix moth another kind of like brown moth that likes to keep its wings down on its back almost like a little shell you'll see a lot of those if you go out mothing on the lower left hand side so the one that's underneath the plume moth that like white fluffy one it's called a, a salt marsh moth you'll probably see these closer um in like north san jose or kind of in san francisco or around the bay because they love salty air and so salt marsh moth. You'll also probably find the glassy winged moth, which is the moth at the very bottom in the middle. Uh, it's a very cool moth and it's quite common, especially in the South Bay. So I'm also excited to maybe find one of those. And last but not least, the very bottom right hand side, the moth that you see that's in that yellow flower is called a small heliothotis moth. I think I said that right. Heliothotis moth. Um, and that heliothotis moth is a moth that's commonly active during the day and a moth that is very commonly mistaken for a butterfly because it is out and active during the day. But as you can see in this photo on the very bottom right hand side, it's got those long antennas that go out to a point. It's got a weird fuzzy body and its wings are kind of, it's resting wing position. It's pointing backwards, kind of towards its back. So for those reasons, we can determine that it's a moth and not a butterfly. And so when you're out in the Bay Area, keep an eye out because whether it's at night or during the day, you are probably gonna get the chance to see a moth doing its thing, which is very cool because it's a really hardworking pollinator that we depend on and we overlook very often. So now that you know that moths are very important and are often very overlooked, how can we, or how can you, help support these wonderful little creatures? Uh, and I would suggest, I would strongly suggest you get out there during National Moth Week to celebrate these little critters. National Moth Week is in July. It's July 20th through the 28th. And National Moth Week is basically set up and designed to correct the problem of moths being overlooked. Because most moths are active at night, 
people often just don't get the chance to see or appreciate them that much. Um, oftentimes moths are considered like a pest or a nuisance, but most moths that are active at night are actually really beautiful and are serving a really important purpose ecologically by pollinating. So National Moth Week is designed to inspire people and engage with people to get them outside at night and try to see moths. So how can you go out and see moths during National Moth Week this year? Mothing is pretty easy. It's called mothing, just like birding, if you want to go out and see birds. If you want to go out and see moths, it's called mothing. Um, if you, all you have to do is go out at night, find a light source, so whether that's your porch light, a flashlight, or if you have a UV light, that's also really effective for helping find moths. And some kind of white surface is best. So whether it's a white sheet or a white blanket that you hang up, point the light out uh, and wait for moths to come. Moths are very attractive to light at night. People Scientists don't really know why that is. There's no official answer for that yet. There's a common theory that it's because they rely on the moon to help navigate them. And so they just are drawn to sources of light for that reason. Uh, scientists don't have an actual answer. But if you shine a white on a white source or white surface, a white wall, a white blanket, you will get many insects, including moths. So all you need, a white sheet, a light source, and some way to identify what moths you're looking at or a way to take photos of the moths. Um, one amazing thing to do is if you're out there and you're celebrating National Moth Week, you're looking at moths, take photos of the moths you find and try to post them if you want to go above and beyond. That way other people can get to see the moths that you found and help you try to identify them. A great way to do this is again, using iNaturalist or Seek. Um, during the, if you check out nationalmothweek.org, they actually highly encourage you to become a citizen scientist and take photos on iNaturalist while you're out mothing and submit them to the, uh, to the crowd at iNaturalist so they can help you identify and help record the different moths that you're seeing all over the world or all over the nation. This is a great way to you know, kind of be a little bit of a scientist. You're IDing these nat natural insects that you find and it helps to record the and add to the database of knowing what moths are where. Because like, again, moths are under research because they're often out at night. And so even just the little bit of science that we can do in our backyard helps add to the record of knowing what moths are where and when. Because a lot of moths migrate, a lot of moths move throughout the year. Some are more active during the summer, some are more active during the spring. And so getting out there consistently and recording what moths you find can actually tell us a lot about these different moths in our neighborhood, which is very cool. I will add that if you are not actively mothing, I would encourage you to actually turn off any additional outside lights because moths have an important job to do. And if you leave, for example, your porch light on overnight or some kind of outdoor light on, it will distract the moth and make it an easy target for predators. So bats or birds will find moths out around the lights. And so if you turn those off, you are helping protect the moths and you're helping support the moth to do its own thing. So when you're mothing, get out that sheet, get out that light, uh, and see what moths you can spot. But if you're not mothing, make sure you turn those outside lights off. That way you're giving the moths the space to do their own thing. Nice. We are at 12.28. And it's time for any questions. Thank you all so much for joining me during that little presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And again, feel free. I'm going to ask questions now, help answer questions now. So if you have any questions, put them in that little Q&A box. And, okay, and we'll stop sharing so I can read the Q&A questions. One person asked if I will be sending out the recording of this presentation. Oh, 
I'm sorry it took you a while to get in. We This is recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube page. So I can send out the link to through Inventbrite. I can send out the link to the recorded YouTube version that we can watch it. Another question asked, why are bug lights yellow? Mm, that's a good question. I Clarifying question. Do you mean like bug lights that are specifically meant to like attract bugs? Or um, do you just mean like, why do you use yellow light happen to attract bugs? I know that UV light is usually the best light source if you want to attract a lot of bugs because UV light appears different to insects than it does to humans. And so it's just a much more effective attractant. Um, so maybe yellow light, like a yellow light has a similar wavelength to that and where it's, it seems more attractive to them. Yeah. Okay. And then he said, yellow lights don't attract bugs at night. Yeah, I mean, that would make sense. I think yellow light is a very, um, it doesn't seem like a very strong wavelength. I know that when, oh, I almost forgot to mention, uh, on July 20th, we're having a program all about moths at Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve. And so if you'd like to join, you can sign up online on Eventbrite. Uh, and you can meet me out in person, out in the preserves, and we can do some mothing together. And I will be using a UV light for that just to get the best way to find the most moths while we're out there. Mm. All right, any last questions before we head out? I'll take one more sip of coffee while I wait. All right. Well, then, thank you all so much for joining me. Uh, again, my name is Michelle Garcia, and we have a free online virtual program at least once a month, usually the first Friday of every month. So tune in next month uh, for our next virtual program. Thanks, everyone. I hope to see you all on the preserve soon. Bye-bye.